Good evening. Right now, Metro police are desperately searching for the person or people responsible for killing a man and a woman. Breaking news now. A triple shooting leaves two dead. Never expect for somebody to tell you your loved one was, was murdered. This Labor Day will mark 42 years that have haunted the St. Cloud family. 30 years. 30 years this family has waited for answers. A couple months go by, three, four, five, six, and you, you really start to struggle with the idea that the case might not get solved and uh, that somebody might get away with murder. It's very unfortunate that we have any cold cases at all, and certainly unfortunate that we have as many as we do. And that's why the Ryan's work and the work of Project Cold Case is so important. Thanks for joining us today. It's uh, May 28th, first day back after the long Memorial Day weekend. Hope everybody had a great weekend and uh, enjoyed some time with family and friends and remembering why we uh, celebrate or honor uh, the memory of all those soldiers that we've lost uh, to, to give us the freedoms that we enjoy. Um, I know I saw a lot of people uh, honoring and respecting those that have fallen uh, over the weekend, which is always good. Uh, today I am joined with our newest victim advocate, newest employee, Frida Washington Perez. Hello. Frida, thank you for uh, coming in here. And I mean, I think I gave you an option. We were going to do this with or without you. Yeah, not you know? much of an option. <laughs> yeah. uh, I feel like it's important for people to know who uh, is working here at, at Project Cold Case. Uh, what their roles are. We've had Clint Richardson in with his, our, our marketing guy. We've had Patty Lord, our previous uh, victim advocate in. We've had a number of our board members in. Um, let's see, who, who came in from the board? We had um, Lorena obviously comes in regularly from our board. Latresa came in from our board of directors. Uh, slowly, we hope to have um, all of our board of directors come in and chime in with what they contribute to the organization, but uh, it's important sometimes to put a face with a name. Uh, if you are calling our office, if you are receiving uh, advocacy from our office, if you had a family that was a uh, family member that was murdered and that case is unsolved, you're going to be dealing with Frida and myself. Yeah. And Frida is kind of the first point of contact. Um, so we want to make sure you know who you're talking to and kind of get a, a little bit of an understanding. Um, why she's here, why she was hired, um, and what she can do to help uh, families of, of unsolved murders. Um, and kind of just touching on it briefly, because we've had a lot of, uh, of people reach out wanting to know <coughs> about Patty Lord, our previous uh, victim advocate, and checking on her, which is very sweet. Uh, Patty is, is doing very well. She uh, did not leave here to you know, take on some other job or anything mm -hmm. like that. She's, uh, she needed some, some time to handle some personal business and some personal affairs, um, which is really hard to do when you're a victim advocate, <laughs> focus on yourself. Um, and she's still very, very much uh, involved with Project Cold Case. She's transitioned onto our board of direct directors, which is actually where Patty started. She was a board member first, offering up a survivor perspective mm -hmm. when we had board meetings. And, um, but the idea was when we did have a position available, she would transition to that advocate role. Um, and then, you know, as, as life sometimes has a way of doing, she had some other things that she needed to, to handle. Um, and she didn't want there to be a, a, a gap in service mm -hmm. or a lack of service to the families. Um, so she came in and, and told us that um, she needed to focus on some home things. And she stuck with us for this long, drawn-out process of trying to hire somebody, which was only long and drawn out uh, on my end. It was trying to <laughs> figure out how to, how to get people to apply, how to put a, a, mm -hmm. a job offer out there. Um, and, uh, but I, I did want to let everybody know that uh, Patty is doing well. She's still very much <clears throat> involved with us. She'll be on our board, uh, at our board meetings. She will still be at our events. She will volunteer here, um, and and you, if you uh, miss her, 
you will see her again. I promise yeah. you. Yeah, she's here. But um, in the meantime, we hired Frida to come in and take on that role. And we're very excited to have Frida here and feel like uh, she's a very good fit and will be very beneficial to the growth of our organization mm -hmm. as well as providing the level of care to the families that we serve that Patty always provided. Um, so let's talk about you. Okay. Um, you and I knew each other previously. Yes, we did at Compassionate Families. At Compassionate Families, which if you've watched any of these uh, past um, Facebook Lives, you'll know I've mentioned a number of times the organization mm -hmm. that I worked for after my dad was killed. I uh, worked with Carl Harms there, who has been on our, our uh, Facebook Lives before. Mm -hmm. And you interned there. I when did. Carl and I there. were both there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then, but then our lives, we took separate paths. We did. Um, well, let me talk. So before, before Compassionate Families, mm -hmm. you were in the Navy. I was in the Navy eight years. Eight years. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for your service. Not a problem. Uh, we'll celebrate you on Veterans Day. <laughs> um, but yeah, you you worked in the in the military. Did mm -hmm. the military bring you to Jacksonville? The military brought me to Mayport in '04, and I just stuck around. You liked it here, the huh? beaches, the sun, the, <laughs> the sun, Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and then you you went to uh, University of North Florida, correct? I did right after um, I got my GI Bill. They paid for my education, went to UNF. I always knew I was going to get into the criminal justice field, but I didn't have a direction after that. So you were studying, and you did get a, a bachelor's in criminal justice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you minored in psychology. Psychology, yes. Um, and you, you kind of uh, started interning at places like Compassionate um, Families. Well, there was a required internship, and I called Compassionate Families, not really knowing what I was getting into. <laughs> um, but, you know, of course, the internship opened my eyes to victim services. Yeah, and, I, and this was a number of years ago. I mean, this yeah. was, you like know. 2010? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, like way back, way back then. You so know, I had to do my associates through FSCJ, and then I went to UNF. Yeah, um, so we, we had that experience together. And then uh, when I left Compassionate Families, you mm -hmm. actually um, stayed on. I you kind of came back mm -hmm. and, uh, and took a position there as mm -hmm. an advocate. I did. I did a lot of volunteering and you know how addictive that is. Yeah. And then it led to a position. So. And so you actually already knew some of the families mm -hmm. that we were serving mm -hmm. here. I did. Um, I know your first day, Patty stuck around and you guys made a call to a family member. Uh -huh. And, and I recognized her voice recognized on the phone. Her. I'm like, I know. I know Keisha. I know Miss Keisha. So, yeah. yeah. So here, here's what we – you don't really do uh, Facebook, so we couldn't stalk no. you and find a bunch of uh, – <laughs> of uh, embarrassing and incriminating well, photos. Well, that's good, but that's a good but, picture but of Camp Maddie. Yeah, so when we worked at, at Compassionate Families, there was a, a, an annual camp called Camp Maddie mm -hmm. that we took children that had been affected by homicide uh, out on a three-day camp mm -hmm. where, they, I mean, we did canoeing, kayaking, zip, zip lining, lining. Yeah. therapeutic activities, uh, mm -hmm. all the things that, that camps are. Um, and uh, and that was a, a picture that we oh, found bus, from yeah. back. It, unfortunately, Compassion Families isn't around anymore, and um, so like their website that had mm -hmm. a lot of the photo galleries on them is not around mm -hmm. anymore. But this was on their Facebook page is still around, mm -hmm. and and uh, that picture of you in the front there on the mm -hmm. bus. You got Miss Edna. Miss Edna, mm -hmm. that was the the counselor that that helped. I mean, we had therapy sessions, counseling sessions mm -hmm. for all. They're all group based, but for all the kids yeah. to kind of help them cope. Uh, really one of the you know more powerful things mm -hmm. and one of the um, one of the things that's probably most missing from this community now that's that true. compassionate families isn't around um, aside from just their general support uh, you know it's really sad not having those camps for kids mm -hmm. anymore um, but that was you know a little bit of your start uh, mm -hmm. you you also interned at the state attorney's office I, I volunteered at the state volunteered. attorney's office um, so that I can shadow some of the other advocates over there because prior I was solely working with homicide. homicide. So after Compassionate Families, I decided to kind of, you know, fine-tune some of my other skills. And yeah, I, I think that's always important to uh, gain new perspectives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so you worked with some juveniles, some elders. Some yeah, domestic, elder, um, of course, homicide with Carl. Um, yeah. But it was very, you know, eye-opening, the experiences yeah. over there. It, it's it's uh, 
very different how a nonprofit mm-hmm. handles advocacy f- yes. versus, you know. That was definitely <laughs> something that stood out. You had more time on the nonprofit side as opposed to system-based Yeah, advocacy. yeah, it's, it's very different. I mean, they're, they're much needed and, mm-hmm. and wonderful, but when you giving the attention, the phone calls that we receive mm-hmm. are not always, you know, I need an answer to mm-hmm. this right now. Mm-hmm. The phone calls we receive is I just need somebody to talk to. Yeah. You know, right. and uh, and you don't really have time to mm-hmm. just chat with people. That's true. That, <laughs> that's have... something I definitely noticed right away. Yeah. But it definitely opened my eyes to um, how other advocates interact with their clients, you know, especially with the elder and domestic. So it's a very delicate way of handling them. It is. It is. And then, again, kind of expanding your, your knowledge base and your mm-hmm. perspective, you did another internship with a federal probation program. I did, I did. Uh, one of the requirements for my bachelor's was an internship, and I lucked upon federal probation. And, of course, that was a completely different side of the coin because I was working with offenders. Yeah, but so. that's an that's a important perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we deal a lot with emotions, mm-hmm. uh, but you have to be able to separate the emotion and look at things logically and and understand um, why things happen the way they do Mm -hmm. in the judicial process, Mm -hmm. why Mm -hmm. they happen the way they do Mm -hmm. in law enforcement. Um, You know, one of the more frustrating things about uh, homicides is when uh, law enforcement has a very good idea or Mm -hmm. maybe even Mm -hmm. knows who did it, but they don't have enough evidence to make an arrest. Uh, they don't have enough evidence to convict beyond mm-hmm. an exclusion to every reasonable doubt there mm-hmm. is. Um, and, and if you can't put the emotion aside and go in there and look at those things and learn those things, you, it's, you're not really helping the families if you can't offer them all, all sides of perspective. Um, I, I did some speaking at prisons mm-hmm. um, for a while. Uh, traveled to a number of different facilities and mm-hmm. spoke to inmates about um, you know my dad's case what happened to me what uh, we were doing at the time at compassionate families uh, always with the idea you know always is a learning experience mm-hmm. for me mm-hmm. to learn more from them but also to share with them how important it was um, you know to take responsibility mm-hmm. for, for um, the, the things they may have done um, I, when I got your resume in, I, I looked through that, and when I saw that, I thought that was interesting because I think it's, it is important for mm-hmm. us to have knowledge of all different aspects. It was uh, de- it was definitely enlightening, but um, it did you know give me a more appreciation for what I'm doing, having that other experience to yeah. see the process on that side. Sometimes it's all about just mm-hmm. gathering the knowledge, mm-hmm. seeing it, and then knowing. Yep, I know which side of the. <laughs> I was definitely I was definitely jaded from compassion. I'm like mm-hmm. I, I have to work with victims. Yeah, so. yeah, it, it is very different. I, I remember the when I would go in and speak to these inmates. And the people that would put on the programs would mm-hmm. say, you know, this is a 12-week program, mm-hmm. and they are just completely different people mm-hmm. from the time they go. And it's completely voluntary, so, mm-hmm. you know, they're not forced into it. They actually want to change, and they want to learn. And and, uh, and some of them did. And some mm-hmm. of them, you know, I, I remember this guy telling me, he's, he said, you know, I, I thought I was a hero. Mm-hmm. He said, I, I killed somebody. He said, uh, but my sister was in an abusive relationship mm-hmm. and she would leave domestic always getting beat up mm-hmm. and and she would leave and then she'd go back and she'd leave and he said she called me one time and she said this is it i'm leaving forever he's put his hands on me for the last time and um and he had apparently done hurt her pretty well that night mm-hmm. and her brother said you know well that's it i'm gonna make sure he doesn't put his hands on her again oh, wow. And he went and, and uh, he killed her husband um, because he was abusing his sister. Mm-hmm. And he said, I didn't run from the law. I'm the one that called 911. And I yeah. thought I was there. I thought they were going to give me an award. You know <laughs> what I mean? I just yeah. killed this guy that's beating up on women and yeah. abusive. And, uh, and he said, and they locked me up and I was convicted. Mm-hmm. Um, my sister wouldn't talk to me. My mm-hmm. nephews wouldn't talk to me. He said, I couldn't understand why. He said, it took me years in prison to understand that mm-hmm. that was not my role. That was not place. my job. Yeah. I'm not supposed to be the enforcer. Mm-hmm. Um, my sister still loved him, even all the things he did to her. Mm-hmm. And he said, it ruined my relationship with my sister. Uh, and I thought I was protecting her. I thought I was doing the right thing. You know, that was a an eye-opening mm-hmm. conversation for me to have with an imp- that I wouldn't have ever had if I hadn't, yeah, if you hadn't have done that taken that yeah. step to go in, into a prison and talk to people. 
that had killed people, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I, I, I thought that was a great, um, a great thing on your resume to show that you allow other perspectives mm -hmm. to not be blinded. I mean, a lot of times it's hard when you're dealing with emotions of, yeah. a, of a loss and an unsolved case. And, and we see it with the families we talk to. Uh, they want justice mm -hmm. and they want it as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. They want answers, and um, and it's sometimes it's just not that easy, you know. And, and when you remove the emotion, and uh, one of the things that you know we do here is we have relationships mm -hmm. with law enforcement, relationships mm -hmm. with the state attorney's office, relationship with other advocacy groups, um, all of which uh, to help us better serve mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the families that we have. And I think you know that that says something, you know to your ability mm -hmm. too, because you have uh, openly accepted those other perspectives and it will make you a better advocate. Mm -hmm. you I know? think also the interesting thing was the uh, court experience. It's different, you know, because it was a federal courthouse. So yeah. I was like, oh, it's a different, you know, way of handling things. So all, that was also interesting. All of that stuff, you know, really does just make you mm -hmm. a, a better advocate. And, and that was, you know, uh, we got some really good, uh, candidates mm -hmm. for this position um and you know like people might be watching this they, they see that you know we've worked together mm -hmm. before and then we knew each other and think that you know that you that, that was all for show uh. but it really wasn't you uh you said something that, again that stuck out you you know you said you wanted to respect the process so mm -hmm. you submitted your mm -hmm. your resume the same way everybody else I did, did. I did. Um, you you know waited to hear back just like everybody else we interviewed seven people I think total we mm -hmm. had 21 applications but there was a process mm -hmm. you know you can apply but then you have to submit your resume and then you have to show up for your interview <laughs> and then you, you know and, and so it was a multi-step process it wasn't difficult stuff but mm -hmm. uh, but you start to to filter through mm -hmm. and eliminate um, people that are just maybe they just see you know the hourly rate and it's more than they're making so they just apply um, you start to separate those people out, uh, but we had, I mean, we really had some quality candidates that uh, applied for this position, um, a, a number of which I told, I'm going to hold on to your resume, you know, we're looking to, to grow, our, our goal is always to expand and to be able to help as many people as possible, and that, you know, we would hold on to their, their resume in case they were still looking when that time comes, um, but of those quality candidates, uh, you were the only one that had advocacy experience. Um, you had that that base of knowledge and different mm -hmm. perspectives, mm -hmm. um, from victims to offenders, to court to homicide to elder to domestic. You know, you had you you already had so much, including the designation that we mm -hmm. have to have for the grant mm -hmm. um, to be a victim advocate, uh, and you weren't going to have to go take a week training course somewhere you know so all of those things really um you know was kind of the perfect scenario uh, i worked on my, my resume <laughs> i worked on the formula for a bit you, you did and you we were talking about this the other day because you've been here for a couple mm -hmm. weeks now mm -hmm. uh we did a, a week transition with patty she mm -hmm. stuck around and, and helped kind of show what she does on a daily basis and then you've had a, a full week you know or so on your own and we're uh we're, we're moving forward but uh, well, we were talking the other day, and you said there was an opportunity earlier this year, like in January or something, and you kind of missed the window at mm -hmm. UNF, you know, and you, yeah. and, uh, and and you just kind of accepted it. You I didn't, did. It just wasn't for me. Yeah. Just... And then the funny thing is, like, we posted this uh, this opening on Facebook because that's what everybody uses now. Everybody except you. Everybody except me. <laughs> so, uh, I heard about it through word of mouth. But through word of mouth, it, it did make its way <laughs> so, to you. I was like, your and, job's out there, so go get it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and you were, I, I mean, I think if memory serves, the very first resume I, that came I, I came hooked in. up the computer and uploaded yeah, my resume. Was, I was ready. It was funny. Uh, for someone not on Facebook, not you were the first Facebook. one to get, <laughs> to get your resume in. And, um, you know, but, and then as... The process you respected the process and as the process kind of unfolded um and i mentioned your name to a mm -hmm. number of people that i respected mm -hmm. there were people that had worked with you at the state attorney's office that oh man she's great you know she's good. gonna be so good 
Um, there was one of our board members that knew you that you had interacted with and done some things with. And when she found out, you know, she put in, chimed in with her two cents. Nice. And, um, and so, um, yeah, it, it really did work out well. And, and I think, you know, uh, aside from already bringing some experience mm-hmm. and some, uh, you know, perspective, uh, you kind of understand that that we want to grow and that we're mm-hmm. not set in any specific way and that your uh, opinion is valued here and matters. And so when you see that we're doing things mm-hmm. that could be more efficient, you know, you, you chime in with that. And we've already started working on growing the organization and doing things, mm-hmm. um, you know, setting a plan in place. And you're a big plan person. You have goals. You set those goals. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so, you know, that's it's kind of good because as I get pulled, you know, sometimes away from mm-hmm. the advocacy stuff and focus on the admin stuff and mm-hmm. the business side of, of running a nonprofit, um, you're still focused on those goals. I got the target for it, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to get that thing up for you so you can uh, you can start mapping out our future. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> like in 10 years from now. <laughs> right. Well, but I am going to admit this. When I submitted my resume, the first one, I'm like, where's Ryan? Why didn't he write me right back? <laughs> I was worried for a second. So. Yeah. How long did it take me to get, get back to you? It was about four days. Was it four days? Yeah. I got a little worried. I'm like, Ryan, I know he saw huh. my resume. Yeah, I can't believe that. Yeah, I apologize for that because I, I I was trying to reply to people right away. But the problem was your process skipped step one because step one was to hit the little button on Facebook oh, that said so you were interested <laughs> in the job. And then my reply was That's send your was. resume. That's what it was. Okay, <laughs> so, okay. so you were already a step ahead because gotcha. you had sent your resume where everybody else I had to physically <laughs> – request that they send their resume so um so you're already a step ahead of the process and it did it did go relatively quickly from that point as far as we wanted to collect Mm -hmm. resumes for about a week Mm -hmm. and we wanted to schedule interviews over you know three or four days and uh and then we wanted to make a decision immediately you know um and so uh we were able to to do that and then um again kind of one of the things that worked out was you were not currently somewhere where you had to put in notice no or two week notice or yeah. anything but we also were in a position that we allow you were allowed time mm-hmm. you know you had time that you could transition mm-hmm. from your other world to this world and yes. um and that that worked out i think well mm-hmm. for everybody patty stuck around for uh, a week mm-hmm. um in between and then stuck around for a week to kind of transition and and we got i mean we, we hit the hit the ground running yeah. so um f- you are you've been helping w- with support groups which has been mm-hmm. something that has as somebody that is a survivor um i struggled uh for a number of months until uh until somebody from Compassionate Families called me mm-hmm. and said, Miss Jones, who we all know and love, uh, Jones. she called me and said, um, literally like a, within a day of losing my job after a mm-hmm. few months after losing my dad, said, hey, we have a, a men's only support group. Would you come to that? And it didn't matter to me that it was men mm-hmm. only. I was going to, you know, I needed, I knew I needed something. And so this was, this was one of those things. And mm-hmm. so I, uh, I showed up at that support group. It was uh, myself and three other uh, individuals, and all three of them had lost children Mm -hmm. to homicide. And that was really a turning point for me because a lot of times you feel like nobody understands, like your your situation is worse than everybody Mm -hmm. else's. And and then you get into that kind of uh, an atmosphere where people are are talking and sharing, and you realize you kind of gain perspective Mm -hmm. again, perspective. you know, those three people had all lost children and I lost a father and I was supposed to bury my father, just not the mm-hmm. way that I did. And they were never supposed to bury their children, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and so it, it was almost uh, inspiring to me mm-hmm. because I could see three men that had uh, somehow figured out a way to survive. Probably the worst thing that mm-hmm. anybody could probably ha- ever go through, losing a child to a, a, a violent uh, act. And... Um, 
So I, uh, I kind of, I mean, literally started volunteering like the next month mm-hmm. at one of our, uh, the day camps that they did out there. Oh, yeah, the and, day camps. Yeah, Youth Hope. And that was, <laughs> I mean, that was, uh, it was on my birthday. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so I was like, I told my wife, she's like, what do you want to do for your birthday? And I was like, actually, I'm going to go volunteer <laughs> at this camp for kids that lost loved ones to, to murder. And she was like, uh, okay. <laughs> she's like, I'll see you when you get back. <laughs> you know. But so. I think that's interesting, too, because I haven't really met anyone who haven't volunteered doing this or helping victims that wasn't instantly addicted to just giving back and helping. Absolutely. That's how I stayed and, around. And that was, you know, one of the questions during the interview process was uh, volunteer. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, do you volunteer mm-hmm. and where do you volunteer? Because I don't, I don't think that it's – you know, it's not maybe necessary that you volunteered mm-hmm. with a group that dealt with homicide, mm-hmm. but when you volunteer and you're doing mm-hmm. it because you want to do it, not because you're getting something out of it, yeah. you're getting paid, it, it shows something, you know, and, and whether it's, you know, with victims of crime or, uh, you know, children suffering mm-hmm. from, you know, illness or cancer, uh, you know, the running a marathon for for breast cancer, but volunteering mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. it, you know, when you've committed yourself to to something like that, um, you're right. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you don't typically volunteer for something and then never have anything else mm-hmm. to do with it. Like you, all of a sudden, you, you start to see what it's for you and who it helps. Invested in the mission. I yeah, mean, that's what my perspective was. Yeah, exactly, and that was why one of the questions in the interviews was, you know, what volunteering do you do, mm-hmm. and um, and that's usually pretty telling, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, just, um, but those, those support groups, I mean, that's how it all started for me. That was kind of the turning mm-hmm. point was support groups. And, and when we were at Compassionate Families, we had built a really good support group. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, support groups are tough. People don't typically, if they've never been, they don't want to come. Mm-hmm. They're worried that it's, you know, they're going to be put on the spot and told they have to tell their life story yep. and have to talk. Mm-hmm. And, um, and and that's not the atmosphere that we want to create. We want to uh, create an atmosphere of comfort and mm-hmm. trust where if you don't want to talk, you can mm-hmm. sit there the entire time. I mean, we ask you to introduce yourself mm-hmm. and, you know, if you can tell us uh, who you lost. Mm-hmm. But that, that's pretty much uh, as much as you have to say. And also, we also let the families know that the, even if they never show up to the support meetings, they're there. So yeah, they always have exactly. that opportunity they, to show up when they're ready. Exactly. Just knowing that that service is, and is Car- there. Carl and I used to, to joke and we'd say, uh, say, you know, there were some people that you just wanted to hit them over the head and drag them in because you knew it would help them. Uh-huh, you have but, to come. But you can't force it. You like cannot. You have to want it and you have to be at mm-hmm. a place where uh, – hearing other people's Mm -hmm. stories will help you, you know, and telling your story will help you. And, um, and so it's, you know, it's not for everybody Mm -hmm. and the timing isn't always right. And so that's the the goal is like, we we keep a consistent schedule Mm -hmm. of support meetings every month. And, and, you know, there will be times where no one shows up Mm -hmm. and there will be times where, you know, we fill a room and we did that with compassionate families and, and it takes a while to get going, mm-hmm. and uh, but once it gets going, it really is beneficial to people. Patty will tell you, you know, that was something that was a huge, mm-hmm. you know, uh, boost and turning point in her grieving was support meetings. And um, so it's kind of fallen off a little bit, and and now that uh, you're here, mm-hmm. kind of kind of focus on that a little bit and get yep. that back going. We have our first one since you've been here uh, Thursday. Yep. The 30th on the Thursday. The 30th, May 30th, from 6 to 8 here at Mm -hmm. our office on 10 South Noonan Street. Mm -hmm. Um, There's downtown after 6, there's pretty much nobody around. So there's street parking that's free, and there's a a lot in our building that will have open spaces as well. Um, You can come and go as you please. Um, You can say as much or as little. I, I shouldn't say you can say as much. Uh, we try to keep to a six to eight so that everybody can get home. So uh, you're free to talk about your loved one and, and your struggles. Um, but we also want to share, make yes. sure that everybody, everybody has, has, the has the opportunity to talk. So you can talk as little as you want. <laughs> and you're welcome to tell us about your families again. Uh, Thursday, mm-hmm. six to eight in our office. And we're, those will be regularly every, yes, month. every month. One, one day. A, 
between depending on things it's usually on a thursday the third or fourth thursday of the month just kind of depending on what else is going on but we're gonna we're gonna focus on those for a while so we'd love to have you join us uh if you can't do it this week make sure you follow our facebook page and you like it and you'll see when that's going to be next month and then mm -hmm. frida you usually call families that call have shown interest and, email. and mm -hmm. email families that have shown interest and we give you a reminder because we know that um you know it's easy to to hear it and if it's not on your calendar then mm -hmm. you forget so um so we try to keep keep a reminder through social media and through uh, contact with our office um if you have other questions you're you know you're welcome to call our office 904-525-8080. Um, uh, one of the other things I wanted to talk about, you've shown an interest in grant writing. Yes, that's on my five-year my five year goals. So we are obviously a grant-funded, mm -hmm. mostly uh, organization. And, um, and we have uh, a number of uh, well, not a number. We have a, a few grants that we get now that mm -hmm. kind of help help support uh, us and allow us to not charge families mm -hmm. anything, which we would never do anyway. But but that's how we survive, how we mm -hmm. have an office, how we get paid, um, and and so um, there's so many grants mm -hmm. out there, but they're so complicated to kind of sort through and figure yeah. out, you know, whether we're eligible, mm -hmm. um, what. You know what's the the kind of the return on investment because mm -hmm. if you spend f um, three months applying for a grant that's going to pay out two hundred and fifty dollars, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. then it's not really worth worth the time. And then uh, you know most of these grants, almost all of them, you have some kind of uh, reporting mm -hmm. to do to to show what you're doing with that mm -hmm. money, to mm -hmm. show how you've used it and what benefits you've received from it. Um, so it's it's never just saying, hey, we run a nonprofit. And they say, hey, that sounds like Our you do good work. Our mission matches yours. Yeah. Let's, let's do this Here's together. Here's a check. So, and yeah, it doesn't it. work that way. No, so, but but we've we've started, you're, you're kind of filtering through some of those. We've mm -hmm. already handed some off to you mm -hmm. to um, to see, you know, what, what happens and that's going to be yeah. great experience for you and then you know also project cold case mm -hmm. you know might benefit from uh from stuff like that so um so i i mean i don't i've never met a lot of people that are like oh grant writing, grant writing is so yes, awesome let me get into it. <laughs> but yeah, you are um, so again compassionate families especially when we lost camp maddie i saw that you know the, how important grant funding was for those um activities yeah. and I want to get my hands on that. It's, well, on, good. My, it's on my target board. And, there you uh, go. Well, you know, five-year plan for that. Well, perfect. Well, we'll give plenty of opportunities to practice <laughs> grant writing. Um, hopefully, we'll have some success. And, you know, that's really how an organization like this is able to expand and mm -hmm. grow is uh, we've got grants that handle certain things. And a lot of grants out there are not high-dollar grants, but they're very mm -hmm. specific grants. Yeah. And so... You know, they might be willing to give you a, give us a few thousand dollars, but they're going to say, this is what we mm -hmm. need you to do with that money. And, and sometimes that that equals expansion into into new arenas, which we're always open we're to okay with and, and we're good with. Um, so, uh, Frida, do you have anything you want to add or nothing, nothing no? that needs to be added? OK, well, um, if you need to get, if you want to get in touch with Frida. Uh, you have the phone number. We just gave it to you. It's area code 904-525-8080. That's typically going to get you Frida. Um, she, uh, you can also reach her through her email at FridaWP at projectcoldcase.org. So if you need to get in touch with her that way, you can do that. Uh, Frida, thank you for, for being here and taking on. Uh, advocacy and and uh, supporting families that have lost loved ones to unsolved murders I think it's going to be a wonderful uh, fit mm -hmm. it has been so far I think it will continue to be and we're looking forward to having you around for a long long time of course <laughs> all right good deal uh, a couple of little things just to remind all of you that are watching uh, our um, scholarship is, is still available. The application is still out there. It's a $1,000 scholarship to anybody expanding their education through uh, college, university, trade school. Uh, you, you don't have to be a survivor of an unsolved homicide victim. Um, 
you don't have to live in Jacksonville. The, the restrictions are, are pretty limited. I think there's a minimum GPA and you have to be going to school because mm -hmm. uh, we're going to send the check to the school, not to, to the individual. But um, that's in partnership with our, our good friend DJ7 um, and through the help with uh, some businesses like uh, uh, Group 4 Design and the, the Lucius family and some other uh, donors that have allowed us to give what was supposed to be a $500 scholarship will be a $1,000 scholarship this year and we've already got um, uh, the ability to give scholarships in the future. So we're looking to grow that as well. Uh, you go to our website, uh, projectcoldcase.org forward slash scholarship. Uh, the application is on there. The contact for any questions is on there, but the deadline is July 1st. So uh, we've received a few app applications, a few essays, but we need more to make a decision and give that money away. So uh, check that out and share that with any family or friends that, that could use it. Um, also, we have partnered with Hard Knot Designs. Um, they're the sign you see behind us. It's in that graphic there, kind of in the middle. Uh, they uh, do wood burning on ornaments, coasters, signage, uh, uh, hangers, uh, trays. They do candles, and um, they've been a big supporter of ours for uh, about a year now. And uh, so you can go to their website at hardknotdesigns.com, and it's not K N O T. A little play on words there, the knot of a wood. So hardknotdesigns with an S dot com. Uh, use the discount code PCC, which stands for Project Cold Case, and you'll receive 10% off your order, and we get a donation from every single sale. Um, so uh, keep that in mind for weddings, uh, Father's Day coming up, uh, graduation gifts, um, uh, holidays, anything like that. They've got some great stuff, and, uh, and uh, this was one of those things where they – really like what we were doing. Uh, they had a connection to Clint, the owner of Hard Knot Designs, uh, and Clint knew each other from college. And, and so they got connected that way, made the sign for us, donated some coasters last year to our event. And uh, Colton called us up and said, I just love what you guys are doing. I want to be a part of it more, and I want to do a long-term uh, fundraising uh, uh, program for you. So um, go to the website, buy from him, use PCC as the discount code. And you'll get a great, um, great product, and, and uh, we'll get a donation as well. And kind of along the lines of supporting Project Cold Case, we're always looking for ways that people can do stuff without actually coming out of their mm -hmm. pocket mm -hmm. more money. So, you know, the Hard Knot Designs, if you're going to buy something like that, buy it from, from Hard Knot Designs, and, and then we get a, uh, a portion of those sales. Same with Jaguar tickets. If you live in Jacksonville and you're – wanting to go to any uh, Jaguar home games this year, uh, go to projectcoldcase.org forward slash Jaguars, uh, and that page will have a link that you purchase tickets uh, at a special nonprofit rate, $40, $45, and $50 a piece, and uh, Project Cold Case gets a portion of those sales uh, up to $30. So... Um, so we're, we're already making, uh, have sold a lot of tickets, and those tickets are limited. So we know people like to wait around in Jacksonville, but definitely buy your tickets through that link, and, uh, and it will support us, and you get to go watch the Jaguars hopefully win some football games this year. And uh, kind of hand-in-hand in hand with that is our uh, Survivor Family sponsorship packages. If you don't necessarily want to go to a game, but you want to send one of our families to a game, we have a, a sponsorship package that allows you for $125, we'll send two family members uh, to a Jaguar game and provide them with $25 in Jag Bucks to, to eat and drink um, while they're there. If you want to send a family of four, it's $250, and we'll send four um four survivors to a game with $50 in, um, in Jag Bucks to, to feed the family. Um, reach out to us. Let us know if you're interested in that. Thanks for watching uh, this week's Project Cold Case Facebook Live. Thanks, uh, Frida, for surviving this <laughs> uh, quick little 30-minute introduction to you, uh, for you. Um, we will, if you, again, 
visit our website, projectcoldcase.org, for information on what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. You can go there to submit cases of loved ones uh, under the contact tab. You can check out our frequently asked questions to find out um, you know, all those little details about what we do here and why. And uh, we will see you next week for another Facebook Live. Thanks a lot.